And let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to gather around your word. And we recognize that your word provides us the stability that we need, the contentment that we need. peace, everything that, that causes us security of our mentality during these times in which much trouble is taking place around us. But chapter 9 in the dispensational portion is God's past dealings with Israel. That's the main focus. Chapter 10 is God's present purpose for Israel. Again, that's the main focus. And the main focus of chapter 11 involves God's future purpose for Israel. And uh, Romans was written right about A.D. 57. And uh, how do I remember that? Because of Heinz, 57 varieties. <laughs> and because according to our president, we have 57. Uh, never mind. Um, Romans chapter 9 is not, uh, actually Romans chapter 9 through 11 are not dealing with individuals per se. And that's where people get confused. Individuals are mentioned as illustrations and as examples. But these chapters are really not about individuals, but are about people groups. And a failure to understand this has led to uh, the notion of double predestination that is held by the Calvinists and the notion that a believer can lose his or her salvation that is held by uh, Arminians. And some key verses in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 I'd like to take a look at just to, uh, so we'll kind of get used to considering the people groups that are involved. Romans 9, beginning at verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. And he's writing uh, about 10 years after his first missionary journey, uh, during which he had great success among the Gentiles. Verse 31, but Israel pursuing a law, and if you'll notice, that's uh, at least in the New American Standard edition, that has a, 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 a small it begins with a, a lowercase l because it is, uh, I think W.E. Vine described it the best uh, regarding this verse, a general principle presenting righteousness as the outcome of keeping the law, capital L-A-W, that is the law of Moses. But let's look at verse 31 again. But Israel pursuing a law of righteousness, in other words, pursuing the outcome of righteousness that would supposedly come uh, through the attempt to keep the law of Moses, did not arrive at that law or at the fulfillment of that principle. Verse 32, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They, stumble, they stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, 
I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. And uh, this is a composite from Isaiah 8, 14, and Isaiah 28, verse 16. And Zion, of course, refers, uh, it has a, a real spiritual significance in the New Testament. Uh, Zion was the fortress in what became Jerusalem that was conquered uh, by David, uh, a fortress that in ancient times had been held by the Jebusites uh, high on a mountain. And uh, it, of course, uh, the city became known as the city of David. But Verse 33, again, just as as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. And it's very interesting that Paul remarks in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, and perhaps we'll turn there, uh, during one of the sessions tonight, but uh, Paul refers to the rejection of the gospel by the Greeks because it was foolishness to their uh, supposedly great intellects and a stumbling block to the Jews because of their uh, religious convictions and uh, because of, of their actual uh, religiosity as a way of life. And so we have this passage contrasting what was happening among the Gentiles with uh, what had happened to Israel through Israel's term under the law, which uh, had been about 1,500 years. If you turn with me to Romans chapter 11, that shouldn't be hard to do, Romans chapter 11. And in Romans chapter 11, as the Apostle Paul is winding up the olive tree illustration, which we will study in depth uh, when we get to the verse by verse in Romans 11. But in Romans 11, verse 25, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. And mystery is the Greek word musterion, which we studied, M-U-S-T, long E-R-I-O-N, musterion. And he was writing at a time when there were many uh, mystery cults among the pagans. And uh, in order to gain uh, what they claimed was certain knowledge, uh, this happened through an initiation process, and Paul took this term, and as he did actually other terms that were in use at the time, and uh, he expressed the what was actually the um, precise nature of this word which is something disclosed or something that that is hidden until such time as it is disclosed so this supposed knowledge in the mystery cults was hidden un until uh the person was initiated and supposedly gained uh what had previously been hidden from them well Paul uses this in the the very real spiritual valid 
sense of the word, that there was truth that had been previously undisclosed, including uh, the time of Christ's ministry. It was disclosed from angelic, or undisclosed to angelic beings, or hidden from angelic beings. It was hidden from uh, all the people of the Old Testament. It was hidden from the uh, the, the people during the time of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 13 used the term as well, describing the mysteries of the kingdom, literally, from the heavens. The mysteries of the kingdom from the heavens. And he was speaking... In these mysteries, in Matthew chapter 13, of the nature of kind of a suspended animation that the kingdom that he had been proclaiming would take on until the time that the kingdom would be ushered in. But Paul uses this term, mystery regarding the truth that was revealed to him directly by the ascended Christ, and we'll see that tonight, after the conversion of Paul, previously known as Saul, from the city of Tarsus. And this is a part of this mystery truth, Romans eleven twenty five. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. And here he is describing a component of the mystery doctrine revealed to him, the, the particular mystery or undisclosed truth he's talking about in this verse, that he doesn't want us to be ignorant about, and and uh, those to whom he was specifically those to whom he was writing, but by extension, us. So Romans eleven twenty five again. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, this previously undisclosed but now disclosed truth so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And this hardening is the translation of the Greek word porosis, P long O, R long O, S I S. It means a hardening or dullness. He calls it partial because at the time he was writing, uh, following the time he had visited a number of cities, there were Jews who had believed, and there were Jews believing it at the time of this writing, and there were, were Jews who were believing at the later time in which he wrote the prison epistles, and later when he wrote the pastoral epistles. And there are Jews who are believing uh, presently in the world. And when these Jews believe, they instantly become members of Christ's body. But he said, as to this racial species that was established through Abraham and his lineage, lineage of Isaac and Jacob, and uh, then the 12 tribes, and uh, he himself was of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, of course, the Lord was from the tribe of Judah. But he said, a partial hardening has happened to Israel. In other words, all of them haven't rejected Christ until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And we understand that to be until the last person of this present dispensation has believed and 
the rapture occurs or the snatching up of believers who belong to the body of Christ, uh, 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 which Paul described as a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I relate to you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And he gave the mechanics of that event in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, beginning at verse, actually begins the discussion, I believe, at verse 13, and then through the uh, rest of the chapter, where in the the uh, verse 18, I believe it is, he says, therefore I want you to comfort one another with these words. But we get this from context because of the olive illustration, the olive tree illustration that uh, we don't have time to deal with tonight, but that that precedes this. And uh, I will mention verse 24, for if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. He's speaking of Gentiles, and he says it would be contrary to nature because usually you would graft the, the you wouldn't graft wild trees in. You you would graft uh, good trees in or good branches in. You uh, let me uh, back up. You would not graft wild branches into a tree. You would graft good branches into a tree to improve the quality of the tree. But he's saying, for if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches Remember in the illustration, they've been cut off, the natural branches being the Jews temporarily cut off in the plan of God as a people group. How much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Well, when, by extrapolation, by... uh, uh, s- surmising something from what is not exactly known, but from uh, what we do know here and what we do know there. We do know that this event in First Thessalonians 4 is going to take place, and in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one, we do know that uh, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then within a split second, we who are still alive, that is, whatever generation of members of Christ's body is still living, uh, will be taken up to meet the Lord uh, in the clouds of the atmosphere, and so shall we always be with the Lord. And so you put that together with this illustration of the original branches being cut off and uh, saying how much more if you are from the wild, you Gentiles are, are the wild bunch and you're grafted in, how much more are the natural branches again going to be grafted into the tree? It's a simple illustration. There is a national glorious future for Israel. So that's his, uh, the point from which he launches verse 25, for I do not want you, to, brethren, to be uninformed of this previously undisclosed, but now disclosed truth. And notice he says, I don't want you to be uninformed of it, or as the King James Version puts it, I don't want you to be ignorant of it. God did not give us this vast amount of doctrine so that we'd be ignorant of what it teaches. He gave it to us so that we would gain understanding as we endeavor to fulfill the life that he has called us to fulfill. And what would, ha- what would happen through their ignorance 
of this previously undisclosed but now disclosed truth, uh, that would open the door to them becoming conceited or wise in your own estimation. And here's the previously undisclosed secret, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Then verse 26, and so. Now, what we have in the Greek is a, uh, we have two words, actually, that compose this phrase, and so. We have chi, that is, most often translated and, it is very often translated also, it's very often translated even, it is also very often translated then, uh, in speaking of, of chronological sequence. And it's translated that way 105 times in the New American Standard Version. It's translated into the English as the word then. How do I remember 105? Because I used to live on 105 Wilmot Drive. So, verse 26, let's, let's consider that, that what Paul is getting at is the sequence of this, then, and then what is translated so is how to, uh, H-O-U-T, long O, which means in this manner. So let's translate it then in this manner, and he's about to describe the manner by citing passages from the Old Testament, and then in this manner all Israel will be saved or delivered. Again, we're not even, uh, although eternal salvation is involved, Paul is getting more at the national deliverance of Israel uh, to be restored as a nation, as uh, the nation which will be prominent on the earth during the 1,000-year rule of Jesus Christ. But then, in this manner, all Israel will be delivered, just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion, that's uh, from Isaiah 59, 20, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob, this is my covenant with them. Uh, these are citations from Isaiah 59, 20, Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34, uh, and uh, uh, the last clause, when I take away their sins, Isaiah 27, 9. So Paul's giving the, the he's just citing some scriptural footnotes or citation for how Israel is going to be delivered after the fullness of the Gentiles has been completed. In other words, after the rapture of the church. And it's going to happen uh, through a seven-year period described as Daniel's 70, uh, 70, 70th week, the, the 70th of Daniel's 70 weeks, or units, literally units of seven, Shabua, in, the, the, uh, in Daniel chapter 9. And it'll be a seven-year period, and of course then the Deliverer is going to come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. He's actually going to return to 
Zion at the second advent. Uh, he's going to return specifically to uh, the Mount of Olives. But then the deliverance of Israel is going to be performed uh, when the Lord is ruling from Jerusalem. And this is what Paul has been describing as this mystery. This is not the prophetic plan. And, and the olive tree illustration, where the, the original branches were cut off and wild branches were grafted in, that was not the prophetic plan. The, the prophetic plan calls for the world to be blessed through Israel's prominence, through the national glory of Israel through Israel's political and spiritual glory. And that is how the Gentiles in the prophetic word are to be blessed. And Israel as a nation rejected, hated the Gentiles, was prejudiced against the Gentiles, rejected God's plan, uh, for them to be blessed through Israel and bottlenecked God's program. But when considering some of these things, I just wanted to, to uh, bring those verses out so that we, we start, it starts to sink in. In these chapters, we're talking about people groups. We're talking about Israel, we're talking about God's dealings with Israel in the past. We're talking about uh, God's purpose for Israel in the present. And we're talking about God's fulfillment of specific promises to Israel in the future. And the apostle is bringing all these things out in these chapters and, and how the Gentiles fit in but how the Gentiles fit in during this present time and in, in the manner uh, they fit in in this mystery that was revealed to exclusively to the Apostle Paul. Uh, this, was, this was completely new and different concepts. This was not the prophetic word. Paul was just saying in verse 26, then, it, then things will shift back to the prophetic word and the prophecy for Israel will be fulfilled to the letter. But that's after the rapture of the church of this present dispensation. Now, let's... Let's consider in background, as we learn that, that these chapters are really about Israel, the different phases of Israel, and the Gentiles, and what God is doing with the Jews presently, but also what he's doing with the Gentiles presently, what he's going to do with the Gentiles, and what he's going to do with the Jews and let's go back from A.D. 57 when this was written and uh, go back to A.D. 30 and go through a few portions here. This is one of those uh, getting the big picture nights. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 20 uh, Luke chapter 24 and remember the primary focus of the Lord Jesus Christ during his three and a half year ministry in his unglorified humanity 
was announcing the kingdom, what he called in in Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the term is used uh, over 30 times, the kingdom from the heaven. It was proclaimed, or the kingdom from the heavens, literally. Heavens is plural, and it's from, uh, not of. And uh, I'm a little bit of a stickler on that because it is actually, uh, its basis is in Daniel 2, verse 44, the promise that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom uh, would be set up on earth, and that was the conclusion of the multimetallic uh, image dream that uh, had that Nebuchadnezzar had and that, that Daniel interpreted. But it was the promise that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom on earth that will never be destroyed. And so the kingdom then from the heavens is what Matthew was proclaiming. And and, uh, any Jews who were cognizant of of, uh, the book of Daniel would have have understood what he was talking about. He was was, uh, saying that the prophesied kingdom that, that the God of heaven is going to set up on earth uh, is near. At hand is a translation of something which, which means actually is near or upon us. In other words, prophetically, it, it's very close. And it was prophetically very close when Christ was preaching it in uh, Matthew 4.17 and when John the Baptizer preached it as his forerunner in Matthew 3, 2. The kingdom from the heavens is is at hand. And on the prophetic calendar, it was very near because this interruption in which you and I participate had not yet been inaugurated and was not inaugurated until God converted the Apostle Paul, uh, known at his conversion as Saul, from the city of Tarsus, and Saul, uh, God uh, saved Saul and gave him over a period of many years the Lord Jesus Christ personally by direct revelation taught the doctrine that runs throughout Paul's epistles. And so... In Luke 24, I'm going to take it from verse 13. This is the uh, narrative concerning the Emmaus disciples. Matthew, or Luke 24, verse 13, And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about these things which had taken place. And that was after after Christ had been crucified. And uh, uh, they, didn't, they weren't aware of his resurrection. While they were talking, verse 13, and discussing Jesus, and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? They said to him the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, 
It is the third day since these things happened. So they were looking forward. They, they believed this was the, Israel's Messiah, but they thought their, their dreams were shattered because he'd been crucified. And they thought he would restore the Davidic dynasty to Israel and uh, bring on the, the prophesied kingdom. Verse 22, But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body and came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. So they did acknowledge that they they had heard of of uh, the possibility of his resurrection. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Or that could be translated then, to enter into his glory. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So what was he telling them? He was telling them that, that the cross had to precede the establishment of the kingdom and, of course, implying that it would only be a resurrected descendant of David who would uh, occupy the throne of David, per the uh, promises of the prophets. So he was saying that, that uh, Christ had to go to the cross, die, and be resurrected before the kingdom could actually be established. And that these things actually did have to happen before the kingdom was actually offered. And we're going to see the offer of the kingdom in a few minutes. But contrary to what classical dispensationalists teach, the kingdom was not offered through the Sermon on the Mount. Only its manifesto was presented. It's a, a modus operandi and the manner in which it would uh, come into being through Daniel's 70th week was also, was also presented in that discourse. But it was never offered. It could not have been formally offered uh, because the cross had not yet taken place and Christ had not yet been resurrected. If you go with me... Um, to, uh, we won't cover all this, but go with me to verse 44, and this is the Lord Jesus. If you look at verse 33 for context, you can see he was now speaking to the eleven and to those who had gathered with them in Jerusalem. And so in verse 44, now he said to him, to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day and that repentance or change of mind for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. 
you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father up on you. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit promised by John the baptizer and promised by the Lord Jesus Christ where Christ would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And we see that word up on, a translation of the Greek epi, uh, throughout the early Acts period where the, the Holy Spirit came or fell upon those who were present. And uh, in some instances, they spoke in national tongues. But that is to be differentiated, because the Bible differentiates that, from the baptism of the Holy Spirit in which we participate, whereby the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen, places every believer instantly, the instant the sinner believes, the Holy Spirit instantly places every believer into Christ, and every believer becomes a member of Christ's body. And that is called uh, the, the baptism, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, that it is spoken of, of the, the baptism uh, whereby the Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into Christ. Two distinct baptisms of the Holy Spirit. If you, if you don't understand that, you'll never understand what was going on actually during the Pentecostal era from the day of Pentecost on through, through a number of years, what was going on then and why things aren't going that way today. There is a reason for that. They're not supposed to go that way today. And we're not, uh, Pentecost is not the precedent for the, the Christian way of life of this present dispensation. It is not. The writings of Paul primarily constitute the Christian way of life for this present dispensation. So verse 49, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. How were they going to know they were clothed with power from on high? Through some kind of sensory perception, obviously. And we don't, when we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into union with Christ, it, we don't feel it. it. It's a positional reality, a spiritual reality, but we don't feel it. Some of us feel good about it. Most of us feel good about it once we understand what has happened. We feel good about it even if we don't understand what has happened. We just understand something has happened, and we feel, about, we feel good about that. We understand that Christ died on the cross in our place, and we believe on him, and we feel good about that. And understand, I'm his child now, says the word. And uh, we feel good about these things. But they were supposed to uh, stay in the city until clothed with this power from on high. And then, of course, Acts 2. Uh, describes what went on with that. Verse 50, And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Now, catch how the last verse of, of Luke closes. They, are, they were exactly where they should have been in the temple, 
praising God. They were continually in the temple praising God. Now you can go with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And in Acts chapter 1, uh, I'm going to start at verse 4. This is, of course, the resurrected Christ with his disciples. Acts 1 verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And th so they would be baptized. Christ would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. And uh, this was going to happen, and it happened in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Verse 6, so when they had come together... They were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Why did they use the term restoring instead of establishing? Because isn't Jesus going to establish a kingdom? Yes, he is, but he's also going to restore a kingdom. He is specifically going to restore the Davidic dynasty to the throne which is an, a very important feature of the covenants given to Israel. And the Davidic covenant was given in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and it specified that a descendant, uh, a, a descendant of David was going to rule over Israel forever. And so... That's what they had in their minds. So, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They knew he was a descendant of David, called the son of David. That doesn't mean the direct son. That means uh, we use that term today somewhat, but they used it more often back then. But it means he was a descendant of David. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, upon you, upon you. Just uh, want that to sink in. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And uh, we'll skip over Acts 2, Pentecost, where most of us are pretty familiar with what happened there. But uh, let's go to Acts chapter 3, and uh, a, a marvelous portion in the Word of God that was actually assigned to Israel, recognized by the rulers of Israel who were under the influence of evil, but they, were, they recognized what happened to this lame man in Acts chapter 3 as a sign and wondered how they could suppress it and were upset because, because people knew about it. Uh, Acts 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. That's just what they should have been doing. The, the temple was still the center of Judaism, and Judaism was still ongoing. Uh, the problem is that the temple was filled with a lot of uh, religious hypocrites rebuked by Jesus at the temple, uh, kicking over the tables of the, the, the merchants and so forth. But uh, in the plan of God, nothing had changed yet from the temple being the center of worship. 
It's just that the, the spiritual authorities were the, the apostles, not the religious rulers of Israel. And so now Peter and John, verse 1, were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. Now, just a little bit about this man, and we'll, we'll uh, continue this after we break. But a little bit about this man. In, in verse, I think it's uh, uh, verse 20, uh, well, one of the verses there, uh, chapter 4, verse 22. It said that he was more, this man was more than 40 years old. So you got a, a man over 40. Uh, and lame from birth and being carried along. And they used to set him down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. And uh, there are uh, debates about just which gate this was, but uh, we don't have to deal with that tonight. Uh, we can look at that as uh, the uh, as. A beautiful thing was actually uh, going to be offered in this very chapter, uh, and this beggar was at the threshold of it, as were uh, as as were all the people of Israel, if uh, national Israel would accept the offer. But in any case, you have a a, a man forty years old or over. He probably was begging at the temple for at least uh, 20 years uh, and had given up on being healed uh, and was just trying to get by, just trying to get money. He perhaps, Zane Hodges noted that he may have been uh, in a position to actually see the Lord Jesus Christ and his followers passed by a number of times as, as Christ was, was going from Bethany to the Mount of Olives. And that's just a conjecture. But, but if so, you wonder what might have been going on in that, in that man's mind. He could have thought, he, he could have heard some things about Jesus healing some people. And he, he could have thought, Am I, am I just being passed over and and lost in the uh, lost in the shuffle? I sure would would love it if that man would heal me. I mean, who, who knows? But the point being, there was a perfect timing in the plan of God for the healing of this man, and uh, we'll get to that point immediately after uh, break. Uh, see you in ten minutes. Thanks. Uh, let's close in prayer for this portion. Father, we pray that these things do uh, stick with us and that uh, these things in the first session will be used by God the Holy Spirit as building blocks for the things we receive in the second session, all to our greater understanding of your Son and his love and care for us. And we ask this in his name. Amen.